my computer, you know, believe it or not, this computer has no internal mic, <clears throat> which is good because you know, there's no privacy concern. There's no uh, built-in camera either, so I don't have to tape over anything. All right, so the video is still going to be streamed, except there won't be any audio. The audio is, is recorded by my phone right now, so I have to uh, combine the audio and the video you know, when I you know, get home. or I probably can do it later today in my office. Just have to download this from YouTube and then work from that. All right. <clears throat> So during the break, I'm hoping some of you have time to review that material that we have talked about um, right before the exam. And this is this class was the only class out of four classes that I'm teaching right now that got away with a first uh, with a second exam. All of my other classes, you know, did not get a second exam um, because of the the smoke condition and the break. Um, so it's kind of strange that way. <clears throat> Um, I posted an announcement earlier. Um, basically, that is the video. That's the video of the last day that we talked about actual content for this class. So uh, we talked about functions. We talked about how to pass parameters, and I think we also you know dealt with uh, accessing parameters in this particular class. So those were the topics that we were talking about. There's a lab activity today. So we'll go ahead and take a look at the uh, take a look at the lab activity. So the lab activity is down here. It's a it's called function calls. You have one week to do it, so you don't have to do it in, entirely during the lab time. But it will be nice to get it done because you know just because it has a whole week doesn't mean that you you're, you're going to have a whole lot of time because I would keep giving you guys more work to do. <clears throat> so when you look at this, it has several questions. Um, some of these questions are not really intended as questions. Like the first one is not even a question. All it does is to tell you about the conventions. Okay, we push parameters on the stack. The last parameter is pushed first, which means it has the highest address in memory. Local variables are the responsibility of the called subroutine and then below where the return address is. Register D is the stack corner. Register A is used to return scalar results, and so on and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> Register B and C can be modified by the called subroutine. So it is if the caller needs to retain the values in register B or register C, it is the responsibility of the caller to keep to maintain that. The flag register can be modified by a call or subroutine. So if you have a comparison right before calling a subroutine, don't count on the flag register you know, maintaining its value <clears throat> when the subroutine returns. A call subroutine is responsible to deallocate the return address. That's the only thing that is pushed by the caller, but it's the subroutine's responsibility to get it out of, or get um, to deallocate it from the stack. And then the last one is the call, a caller is responsible to deallocate stack space used by the parameters. So that basically outlines the agreement between the caller and the callee uh, when we write subroutines. And this convention is not only for this class, it's not just for the toy processor or the way that I interpret C programs. This is actually universal to all C, how C programs compile to different architectures. <clears throat> And then the next one talks about, this is a particular C subroutine swap, okay? Um, and the question is, are there any global variables? Okay. And obviously, you, can, you should be able to answer that question. And the question number two, this is the actu an actual question, number two. <clears throat> a local variable is by default auto, which means it is stack-based. So unless you say something is static, it is always stack-based. This means the value, the variable, only takes up space during the invocation of the <laughs> containing subroutine. Uh, consider the following C function. So in this particular function, x and y as local variables do not take up any space until f is actually called. 
So until f is called, there's no memory allocated to local variables x and y. So the corresponding code in assembly is going to look like this. So after f, you know, get into after we get into f, we have two decrement d to allocate the space for the local variables x and y. And I think last time I'm not sure you know, which class, either this one or the other one, uh, we act, we actually figure out that it allocates for x and then y. So the address of y is actually below the address of x. So you know, the ordering of allocation of local variables seems to follow um, the, the first local variable is allocated or pushed first. So therefore it has the highest address, and then the last local variable has the lowest address. But that convention is not a part of the C programming language, so that means you know nobody can actually make that assumption when they're trying to do something. <clears throat> and then we have CPRCD, which means we're copying the stack pointer to register C. We load five into A, and then we store that into register into wherever register C is pointing to. So that basically is storing to X, and then the next one is going to store to Y right here <clears throat> and then this f particular function doesn't do anything so the next thing we do is to deallocate the local variables that is the responsibility of the subroutine and then we use the return address on the stack to go back to the caller so this one illustrates the assembly code of this particular function which is not useful at all okay but it just illustrates you know how to how to allocate the local variables and how to access local variables and how to reallocate local variables. <clears throat> so are we okay so far with this? And I think there's a question at the end of this slide. So the questions in your labs are not really just you know questions or just lab activity. It actually includes you know information re relevant to the class. So consider this part of the content of the class. Question number three, um, occasionally we need to refer to the address of a local variable <clears throat> instead of the value. This is actually easy because in order to get to the value of a local variable, we have to get to the address first. Okay? In C and C++, it's an illusion that it is more difficult to get to the address because of the syntax. Because in terms of syntax, we have to use the ampersand to say I need the address of a local variable instead of the value of a local variable. But it's actually an extra step to get to the value because you, in order to get to the value, you need to get to the address first. So it's an illusion in C that it is more difficult to get to the um, address instead of the, the value. So in this case, you know, we have an example <clears throat> and you can see how G, for whatever purpose, I don't even know what G is going to do with the two parameters, but I know that I, we have to pass the address of X and the address of Y to G because the, the prototype of G says it wants to have a pointer to an A-bit unsigned integer and also a pointer to another A-bit unsigned integer. So when we pass the address of X and the address of, of Y to G, this is the code, corresponding code to do. Okay? Once again, I'm not going to go through this code in detail because yeah, that's basically what the lab is for. And this is also why it, may, it might take you more than one lab period to get through with this stuff here because it is actually quite a bit of reading and understanding. And then the next one is back to the code that we started off with, which is the swap subroutine. The swap subroutine takes two pointers. So PDR1, pointer 1, and pointer 2 are pointers to AB integer. And then inside the swap subroutine, we take whatever pointer 1 is pointing to, store that to the local variable T, and then we copy whatever pointer 2 is pointing to to whatever pointer 1 is pointing to, and then we copy the local variable T to whatever pointer 2 is pointing to. So that's a, that's a fairly you know, typical sequence of exchanging the values uh, to locations. <clears throat> so the question is, you know, how do we how do we implement this? So I got some of it already implemented, which means you know you can just copy and paste this code here. So main is already implemented. Um, you can just copy and paste it. 
but you might want to understand me first, okay? Just because it is already done, um, doesn't mean that, oh, okay, you just let, leave, leave it the way it is. Because once you understand main, it will be easier for you to debug your code because you will know what you can expect to be on the stack by the time you get to the swap subroutine. The swap subroutine is the one that you have to write. Okay, so that's why it's empty, so you have to write the body of the swap subroutine. So you have to do it in the TTP uh, assembly code. Okay. Question number five. And this one asks you about a question. What is the value of register D when the program stops? Okay. Assuming everything works okay. Okay. Assuming you respect you know, and use all of the conventions between the call and the callee. It asks you what is the value of register D or the stack pointer when the program stops. When I say the program stops, it means it steps on the halt instruction. There's only one, the very end of main, right here. So the question is, by the time I execute the halt instruction, what is the value of the stack pointer or register D? That's what it's asking. And then the next one. <clears throat> A continuation of the previous question. What do you think is on the stack? Inspect the content of RAM. What is at location FF? So you have to select one of these, okay? And of course, you know, I always make it a little bit tricky by including none of the other options is correct. <laughs> well, that covers my, you know, mistakes too. Because just in case I did not put in the correct answer here, then it's always the possible. It's always the last resort. <clears throat> and the next one. What is the value of the byte at location 0xfd in RAM? So if you read the code and understand main, and also understand what swap is supposed to do, you can actually figure this one out without writing the code. Okay? But I'm not going to tell you what the answer is, of course. Okay? But there are two ways to get to this particular you know, answer. You can implement the code and observe um, the content at location FD in RAM, or you can analyze the code and answer the question that way as well. So there are multiple ways to get this done. <clears throat> and here's question number eight. What construct in the C program corresponds to the content of location FD in RAM? So the previous question asks you what, what it is. This one is asking, you know, which construct in the C program does it correspond to? And once again, you know, we have all of these options to choose from, and this time none of the above is not one of the options. So it has to be one of these. So it can be parameter pointed to, parameter pointed one, can be local variable x, can be local variable y, and also be the return address of the swap subroutine back to main. So it has to be one of these five, okay? <clears throat> so what this means is you have to analyze how the subroutine is called in main and understand how the stack is utilized general in general by both the caller and also the callee. Question number nine is asking you about the content of location FB in RAM. Enter the two hexadecimal digits of the content so you just you know, put in the hexadecimal digits without the 0x prefix. And then question number 10 is asking what C or C++ construct corresponds to the content at location FB in RAM. Kind of the same question as the other one. Um, you have to choose between the five available options. And then the last one is for you to turn in the code, I think. Let's see, this one is just instructions, it's not actual code. So this one is asking, it is telling you how to confirm whether your code, your subroutine is working or not. Uh, you can put a halt instruction right after the code. You can also log your changes to a file and then use a trace to figure out whether your program successfully exchanged local variable X and Y in main. Okay, moving on. 
And then this one asks you to turn in your code in TTP ASM um, so you can upload the file. So this is the last question. All right, so this is a kind of long-ish you know, lab, um, but it is really important that you do it and try to understand the material during the week that you, that you have to work on this one um, because it will help you really understand how to call a subroutine how parameters are passed, how do we access local variables, and all the conventions between the caller and the callee. In this case, the only thing that is not really utilized is a return value, because swap does not return value. Okay? So are there any questions about the lab itself? Any questions? Well, I was hoping someone is going to ask, but which assembler are we supposed to use? Because there are several assemblers now. Did you guys notice that there are like two assemblers now? One is this one. It's it, The name is Assembler Still Works to be Phased Out. And then the other one is Assembler with Postfix Expressions. Okay, I think somebody noticed, right? You know. <clears throat> so we'll start with this one, okay? Um, I also updated the assembler manual to reflect that. But instead of just reading the manual, I'm just going to show you guys how this works. You don't have to use the postfix notation, but it might come in handy sometimes. Okay. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to erase all of this stuff here. This is only for testing. Um, okay. So I'm going to erase all this stuff. And then we'll go ahead and we'll just take a look at some program, some code here. Okay. Um, we'll write a subroutine. Let's see. How about this? And all it does is to return the sum of A and B. A and B are both parameters. <clears throat> and then here's main. Let's say main has a local variable. Uh, we'll call it x. And we'll give x a particular value. We'll make it 6. And then we'll say x equals to um, x, x plus uh, times 2. Okay, there we go. Okay, so this is the C code. Doesn't do anything particularly exciting. Um, so what do you think X should have as a value by the time we get to line 12? 18. 18, that's right. Because we are adding 6 to 12, it returns 18, and then that 18 will be used to change local variable X. So, so the effect of this particular code is you know, it's pretty easy to understand. But it's going to exercise a few things that we have talked about. It doesn't deal with how to pass the address of a variable, but once again, it is harder to pass the value of the variable than to pass the address of a variable, because you have to get to the address first before you can get to the value. Okay? So I'm going to use this as an example, and then we'll write the assembly code to do this. Okay? <coughs> If you have any questions, you probably want to ask those questions as quick as soon as possible because you know otherwise, um, it it can get you know, kind of difficult to understand all this. All right, so what we'll do is we are gonna use um, the typical stuff first. So we'll do a LDID zero, and this is to initialize the stack pointer because zero as the initial value of the stack pointer means there's nothing on the stack. The main label is not particularly useful because you know, all it is is to show you, oh, this is the beginning of the main subroutine, which does not return. It has a halt instruction at the very end. And the first thing we need to do is to decrement D. This is to allocate storage for my local variable X. And now we can figure out what to do with X. So the first actual line that does something useful is line 10, which is, okay, let's go ahead and store 6 into x. 
<clears throat> but the side effect of this line is d points to the x points to x. So if I want to store something to x, I can store to whatever d is pointing to. So now we can do L D I A with six, and then do S T D A. So now this is implementing x equals to six. Do we have Do we have any questions at this point? This is all good. Okay. So now we need to pass that value along. Now you can you can basically say well you know we know what x is okay the value of x is also in a so there's really no need to um, compute it again but let's just say that we don't know okay so we'll we'll go ahead and try to get the value back from um, memory and not make the assumption that it is also in register a at this point so what we need is an LD instruction so now a equals to the value of x, register A, is the value of x. But the first thing we need to pass on is not x, but the 2 times x on the stack, because the second parameter is pushed before the first one. So we have to double it. We do not have multiplication instruction in the TTT ASM, but since it's multiplication by 2, we can just do a left shift. But wait, we don't have a left shift either. So how do we do a left shift? You add a register to itself, and therefore doubling. Doubling is the same thing as a single left, is left shift by one bit. Okay, so you might want to remember that. Okay, it's a very useful trick. So if you just add a to a, okay, so a is now 2 times x. Well, okay, I'll say x plus x, but that's the same thing as 2x. Now we can push it on the stack. So we have the decrement D, uh, STDA. So this way we push 2 times x on the stack. Now we are ready to push just x. There are two ways to reverse this. In other words, we, we know that A is 2 times x and we want x back. We can do a right shift because a right shift is the same thing as a division by 2. But you can also go back to the memory location and we retrieve the value of x which is what I'm going to do here. Well, but that's going to be a little bit difficult because D is no longer pointing to X. D is now pointing to the last, the second parameter on the stack, which is one byte below where we need. But I don't want to change D because if I change D, if I increment D, then if I do have interrupts, it's going to mess up the rest of the stack. So I don't want to do that either. So the proper way to do this is to do a CPR, CD, so that now C is the address of the parameter B, okay? The address of param B. <clears throat> so I can increment D, excuse me, increment C, so that C is now the address of X, and now we can retrieve it using a load instruction. So we can load it back to A, and this time we use C. So the A is now whatever C points to, which is my local variable X. Then we push it on the stack, decrement D, STDA. So this time we're pushing X on the stack. So now we are ready to call the subroutine. Now remember, when we used to call subroutine, we have to first load A with the address where it's supposed to come back to. So this time we'll see what the assembler can do to make this a little bit easier. Okay, so we'll say LDI A with something. Okay, I don't know quite exactly how to express it, but we'll say that you know we need to document the STDA. Okay, this is for pushing the return address on the stack. Then we we can jump directly into the subroutine, which is called add, okay, JMPI, there we go. And we know that when we come back, we should get back to this place here, okay? Return to this location. Um, and by the time we get to this location, we have to increment D twice to get rid of the parameters that are still on the stack, so that, stack, so that the stack remains balanced. 
So we say d allocate parameters from the stack, and then we have to store into x, um, which is a single store to whatever d points to, a which is the return value. So this becomes x equals to add blah blah blah. Okay. And then after this, we have another increment d because the local variable x also needs to be deallocated. So that last increment d is for deallocating my local variable x. Okay, so now we get back to here. So what should we put here if we are not going to use labels? The problem with labels is if you use the wrong label, the assembler cannot say, oh, you're not supposed to use this label, you're supposed to use that label. Okay, as long as the label is defined, it's not going to be, it won't complain about it. So the other way to do this is we can count the number of bytes of the instruction we're supposed, we are supposed to return to from this instruction here. The LDI instruction takes two bytes. The first byte is the opcode, the second byte is the value that you want to load into the register. So it takes up two bytes. So line 18 takes up two bytes, line 19 takes up one byte, Line 20 takes up one byte, and then line 21 takes up two bytes. Once again, we have the opcode followed by the label, and the other byte is representing where we're supposed to go to. So altogether, how many bytes is the increment D of line 23 away from the beginning of the LDI, LDI instruction on line 18? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. So we can say whatever the beginning of this instruction is, plus 6. Yep. Um, you can assemble it and actually look at it. Um, but you can also look at the, um, the microcode is the key. <clears throat> so the microcode is the key because when you look into the microcode of the LDI instruction, it will tell you that it will increment the program counter. So it will load whatever the program counter points to into the register that you specify. But then the next instruction or the next microcode slice is going to increment the program counter. Mm -hmm. So that's how you know that it's going to take up two bytes. Uh, JMPI is the same. All right. So now we have, you know, the dot is representing where we are. Six is representing the number of bytes away from the beginning of the LDI instruction to where we want to be. And then the plus is saying, what do we do with those two things before the plus? Well, we just want to add them together. So this is post-fix notation. It is not infix notation. Infix notation would have read like dot plus six. Okay? The postfix notation is dot six and then a plus. In other words, in postfix notation, you first specify the values and then you specify what you want to do with those values. Is that okay? All right. So this is one use of the new feature of the assembler, because this way, you know, as long as you have, you know, every time you want to invoke or call a subroutine you use this particular template, it will always work. You can copy and paste this code you know, and change only uh, the, the name of the entry point of the call of the subroutine. The rest will always work. You don't need to define new labels every single time. So it's kind of a handy feature. But the next thing we want, next thing we also, also want to do is to define the subroutine add. Okay, so here's the add subroutine. So the other feature that I have also added to the um, assembler is something like this. Okay, so you can you can define a label with a specific value. Before return address colon is always going to be the address of whatever byte is following the label definition. Okay, but now if you specify an expression next to it, then the label is defined to whatever the value of the expression is. So in this case, return address is defined to be zero. Every time the assembler sees return address, it is the same thing as seeing zero itself. Okay? But why is it zero? Because the return address is zero byte away from where the stack pointer is pointing to. 
now this one. Are we doing okay so far? Okay. <clears throat> so the next thing we do is where is my parameter A? The parameter A defined as a label is going to be where the return address is, but it is one byte after that. <coughs> is that okay? So label A is not exactly the address of parameter A. It is telling us how many bytes is parameter A away from where the stack pointer points to at the entry point of the entire solution. Is that okay? So you have to draw a mental picture of what the stack should look like. And we have a spreadsheet. Oh, okay, that's not it. Um, okay. So we'll, we'll finish B first, and then we'll draw a very simple picture for that. So register, uh, not register, this is parameter B. Um, actually, A and B may not work very well. Actually, they do work, but you know I'm going to call this param A and param B, just so that we don't confuse A and B with registers A and B. But because the assembler will still work correctly if I don't use these names. So where's param B? Param B is going to be one byte after param A. So by using these symbolic names, now I can refer to param A using a symbolic name and also refer to param B using a symbolic name. But we'll, we'll just say that we make a mistake, okay? It's a self-referencing label definition, which should not be resolvable, okay? So we'll read we'll, we'll this mistake here and see what kind of error message the assembly is going to generate, okay? Yeah. But very good point. It's supposed to be param A1 plus, because it is one time after param A. Okay, so with, the, with these definitions, <coughs> but when I specify add, I need to first access parameter B and then parameter A. So now I can do LDI C with um, param A here. And then we do add CD. So let's figure out what this is going to do. What do you think C is going to be after these two instructions? Okay, he is the stack pointer. The stack pointer is supposed to be pointing to the return address. Param A is really just a fancy name of one, okay? So C is now the stack pointer plus one. What is at that location? Param A, okay? So that means, you know, after this, C is the address of parameter A. which is not really what I want because I want to get to the value of parameter A, but that's pretty easy to do. Uh, An LD instruction will do it. So now C is actually parameter A because I dereference it. Then we can do the same trick with the other one. So we can do LDIB with param B. Actually, I'm going to use A this time. It's handy. So we'll use A this time. And we'll load it with load it with the symbol the symbol param B, and do the same thing here. Add A D. So after these two instructions on lines thirty seven and thirty eight, what do you think is going to be in register A? The address of parameter B. Very good. Okay. But I want the value of parameter B. So L D A A is going to get it done. So A is now the actual value of the parameter. And the return value is supposed to be just the sum of parameter A and parameter B. So we can just do an add A C this time. So that A is now param A plus param B. And that's it, we're done. So now we can use the usual return code, which is um, LD, um, I can we use register B or C, so A is out of the question. Why can't I use register A to retrieve the return address? 
Exactly, because register A is being used to specify the return value. We can't use it for any other purpose. Okay, <coughs> but register B and C are still available. So we can use one of, one of those two. I can use C. So C is now the return address. Increment the the allocate the return address on the stack, and then we have a JMPC this time to continue in caller. That's it. So the fancy feature that I want to illustrate is lines 31, 32, 33. We can now associate symbolic names to offset on the stack. Okay. So that this way I don't have to keep count in my head. Okay? It also makes it possible if I want to add any additional parameters, it would be easier to recalculate all of this stuff instead of in my head. I just have to organize um, the calculations or the equations of the parameters or the offset to the parameters. The other thing that is also that we have talked about already <coughs> is the use of the dot expression. So the dot expression is used when we perform the call because the dot is the uh, address of the first byte of the LDI instruction and I, and I can use it to calculate now you know, where, my, where, I'm, where I am supposed to go. Now the other ones, when you define a label, um, as you can see here, when you define a label, you can refer to just a constant, okay, pretty easy. You can also use any type of postfix expression um, even in, even those involving other nations. Now, of course, the second one, line 33, is going to be problematic because, you know, it is a self-referencing kind of thing and it is not resolvable. All right, so we'll control A, select the entire thing, and then put it into the assembler. Okay. And it is going to take a little bit longer now to resolve everything because um, it actually has to maintain a symbol table. And you can see how it knows that we have a problem. It says the symbol reference cannot be resolved because param B is referring to itself. Okay, So it cannot be resolved. And then anywhere that refers to param B is also going to be a problem because param B itself is not resolved. Is that okay? <coughs> So we can now fix the program just by changing this cell. Okay, we can change the other pro the text also, but it's a simple fix here. So we change param B to param A in the expression, and now everything is resolved. Okay. Yep. Can you say param B uh, on uh, return address uh, two plus? Yep. We'll do the same thing. Yep. How is The zero means, you know, at the entry point of the subroutine add, right here, um, the stack pointer points to the return address. Okay. That's why it's a zero, because it is the offset of the return address from where the stack pointer points to is zero. The stack pointer is pointing to the return address. So you just set it to know what D is pointing at? It's not setting anything, you know, this is really just a symbolic definition. It's just that, you know, if I want to know where parameter A is, but it's relative to the return address. I want to know where parameter B is, but it's, it, that's relative to parameter A. How does the label know what our stats point to? It does not. I know, and that's why I define it to be Z. Okay, so... You, you have to uh, kind of draw a picture. <clears throat> Let me see if I still have a... Nope, I don't have a spreadsheet still open, so that's okay. We'll make one. Okay. So when you call a subroutine, okay, so we'll go ahead and say this is... I'm just making some random assumptions here, okay? So let's say this is location, you know, FE... <clears throat> this is location FD, this is location FC, okay? So when we push the parameters, we have to push the last parameter first. 
which means B is going to be pushed here. Okay, This is where parameter A is going to be, because that's pushed second. And this is where the return address is, because it's pushed last. Right after we push the return address, when D is still pointing here, we jump into the entry point of the subroutine, okay. right? So that means the stack pointer is pointing to the return address. Okay. So the offset of the return address from where the stack pointer points to is zero. Okay. So in other words, the other way to express this is to say, oh, this is d plus zero, using infix notation. This is d plus 1, and this here is d plus 2. So the 0 is return address as a label, and then the 1 is param 1 as a label, and then the 2 is param b as a label. telling the label to grab like it, it, it is what is right here why is it it is, he is it is just defined to be zero it is because of my definition that it is defined to be zero so this line here is really just literally telling the assembler and say every time you see the symbolic name return address treat it the same thing as zero as the constant zero <clears throat> And the, the assembler doesn't have any particular, it, it doesn't interpret return address as any special label. Okay? All it does is to say, oh, RDT uppercase ADDR is the same thing as the constant Z. Okay? And then param P-A-R-A-R-M-A, you know, P-A-R-A-M-A is really the same thing as the constant of one, and then param B is two. It, this is just my definition, so that I can use those symbolic names in my own words. Determine the constant zero, but that's nowhere in your stack. It's but it is. But it's two hundred. But it specifies the offset from where the stack pointer points to to the construct that is that is a name of. Stack pointer is. The stack pointer can be anywhere. But where is the return address relative to where the stack point is pointing to? It's zero bytes away from where the stack point is pointing to. And that's why you know we have to do the calculation here on line, okay, let's go up here. So between line 34 and line 35, that calculates the address of parameter A based on two things. Based on both the stack pointer at a time, at runtime, but it also is based on the relative offset between where we find parameter A relative to where the stack pointer points to. So the offset is determined by the ordering of the parameters and the size of the parameters. We can determine that you know, without running the code. But register D on the other hand can only be known during runtime because we don't know, you know who's going to call add from where, so that can only be determined at one time. But we have to add those two in order to get to the address of parameter A. Is that okay? I understand what you're doing once you have it. I just mm -hmm. don't understand. Like, yeah, I see red address zero, that's essentially saying relative to right here, go nowhere. Go right here. This is where we're pointing. Why is that the, the return address? Why? Because that's the last thing the caller is pushing on the stack before okay. the JMP address. Okay. So it has to do with the caller <clears throat> or the sequence of code the caller has to go through. So when you look at the caller's code, okay, where is the caller's code? Down here. Okay. So when you look at the caller's code, this is the last thing it push on the stack, right? 
it's pushing the return address on the stack, and then it do, does a JMPI to the label app. So by the time I get to the label added in this program, the stack pointer, register D, is pointing to the return address. Okay. And that makes the offset of the return address from where the stack pointer points to zero, because it is pointing right at that. Okay. Okay. The labels are defining their symbolic names of the offset from, of those constructs from where the stack pointer is pointing to at the entry point of a of a subroutine. Is that okay? Maybe. Okay. So the other thing you can also do is to go to the assembler tab and it would actually tell you how the labels are defined here. Um, actually, it may not. It doesn't do that anymore, I think. Um, let's see. Yeah, it does. So parameter A is defined to be 1, parameter B is defined to be 2. <clears throat> And there's also one extra tab here. It's called symbol table. Um, this is a little bit way beyond you know, the scope of assembly language programming. Um, but this is the JSON or the JSON um, representation of a symbol table. But this is my way of storing a global variable in a uh, Google Sheet, uh, Google script for Google Sheet because it has no actual thing as a global variable. So I turn a global variable into a JSON representation, stick it into a cell, <laughs> then I can refer to the cell anytime I want to refer to the global variable. I just have to turn it from JSON back into the object first before I can access the object. But that's way, way, way beyond the, the scope of assembly language program. So anyway, well, we want to see whether it works or not, okay? So we'll go ahead and, um, let's see, download as CSV, and we'll just call this add.csv, and then we'll go ahead and fire up uh, Logisim. I accidentally deleted my Logisim folder, but then I re-downloaded everything. Let's see if it's still there. Yep, still there. Cool. Okay. Load. It's add.csv. There we go. <clears throat> okay, so we are ready to run the program. But instead of just running the program, um, it's good to log you know, what the program is going to do. Now remember, this is not registered. D. This is the data port of RAM. Okay, so it's not particularly helpful. If you want to log register D, it is inside register bank. So register D is one thing that I would definitely log when you're debugging programs these days because that's the stack pointer. Change it to base 16. Um, if you want to log the other three registers, that's fine. Okay, so we'll, we'll log register A, B, and C and change those to base 16 also. <clears throat> um, and then we will log the program point, uh, program counter. PC is also very important, so we'll log that too. Um, and then we'll log some locations in RAM. Okay, we want to figure out you know, how much RAM is going to be used by this particular program, and we'll analyze it first. So we'll go back to the source code, and say, okay, how many locations is going to be used in RAM? We will use one location for local variable x of main. We'll use one for the second parameter of add. We'll use one for the first parameter of add. And then we'll use one for the return address so that add knows how to get back to main. So four locations, okay? That's, I'm thinking four locations. So what we'll do is we'll log five locations, just in case. So we go back to Logisim. <clears throat> so we go back 
255 is going to be local variable x, 254 is going to be parameter b, 253 is going to be parameter a, 252 is going to be the return address, and we'll just store, you know, we'll just log one more just in case. So everything is going to be in base 16, just because otherwise it's going to be pretty long as a binary number. Okay, and then we'll specify what file to log all this stuff to, and we'll say it's add.tsv or tab separate the value in the temp folder. Okay, so we'll close the window, go back to logic sim, and then we'll run it. Control K runs it at full speed, control K again to stop it, and then we'll close logic sim because I think logic sim has a bug. Once you log it like this, once you know it doesn't work correctly, you know, afterwards. So just be safe, okay? You know, let's not assume that it will work. So we'll just close it and reopen it when we need to. And now we can use um, this to import. Okay, so we'll say Okay, I guess open will work too. And this is gonna be add.tsv. And the trick to do this import is to select every single column. So shift click to select all of these and change everything to text. If you change everything to text, it won't try to interpret the numbers. Okay, it just looks a lot better this way. And then it imports everything. And of course, you know, we can relabel the thing. You know, this is the stack pointer. This is register A, register B, register C. This is the program counter. This is uh, at location 255, 254, 253, 252, and 251. Of course, we'll make it look a little nicer by making these columns smaller. Oh, okay. Doesn't didn't select. Maybe I didn't press shift when I click it. There you go. There we go. All right. So if this is the case, okay, when you go all the way to the end of the entire trace. We are expecting x to have a value of 18 in decimal, which is two, which is one two in hexadecimal, because it's 16, which is the one plus two. Okay, so it should be one two in hexadecimal. So we go to here and we do find one two at that location. Okay, let, let me let me change all of this stuff here a little bit. So this way we can keep it up here. So you can see how at location 255, we ended up storing 1, 2 in hexadecimal. That's our 18. Okay. What about the other stuff? 254 is supposed to be the second parameter, which is 12. But C in hexadecimal is 12. This is supposed to be the 253 is supposed to be the first parameter, which is the third value of X, which is 6. Okay, so we got the 6 here. 252 is supposed to be the return address. Now, the return address is not easy to see from the trace, but you can go back to the assembler and use the assemble tab of the assembler to quickly tell what that location is. So you're looking for column W to be 1, 5. Okay. So 1, 5, it's up a little bit. Okay, so here's 1.5. It's corresponding to the increment D instruction, which in fact is where we're supposed to go back to. How do we know that? Because the JMPI to add is right above it. Okay, without setting up the return address, this location would have been impossible to get to. Because it is right after the unconditional one. So everything kind of works out, you know, we can actually identify on the stack, you know, what is what. <clears throat> the other thing you can also do with this trace is to find out when something is changed. 
you can if you scroll back, you can see how local variable x of main was changed to a six at this point. Okay. Where is the program counter? The program counter is at zero six at that time, which means the instruction responsible for this is most likely at location zero five, because the program counter is always one past the instruction that is actually being executed. That has to do with the decode cycle of the processor, also also influence the program counter. Okay. So if we go to location 05, that is going to be a store instruction, or at least I think that should be a store instruction. So we go to location 05, and in fact it is a store instruction. So by looking at the trace and by looking at transitions, you know, the changes that occurs to locations or registers, that can tell you a lot about how a program executes and how we make use of the stack. Is that okay so far? Okay. What about that stuff that made use of the symbolic names? In other words, let's go to this stuff here, okay? So if we look at the lines 34 and 35, by the time we have executed line 35 at location 29, the program counter would be at location 29, register C should contain the address of parameter A. Okay? So that's what the code is telling me. If I go back to the trace, okay, uh, what location again? 29. So I'm looking at 29 in the program counter. So we focus on the program counter column. And we're looking for 29 here. So 2, whoops, did I make a mistake? Oh, it's 1C, sorry, I was looking at the uh, um, decimal, but I should be looking at the hexadecimal. So 1D is what I'm looking for. So when, it, it, when, when the program counter is 1D, register C should be updated to the address of the parameter. So we can see how register C is updated to FD, and FD is 253, which is parameter A. Okay. So that kind of explains how the calculation occurs, because we are putting a 1 into register C first, and then we add the stack pointer to the 1, the staff pointer is FC, FC plus 1 is FD, so that's how we calculated the address of parameter A into register C based on the stack pointer and a static offset. Is that okay or not? Right. So are there any questions about, you know, several things, okay? Are there any questions about how to pass parameters, how to pass a return value back. And are there any questions about how to um, use expressions? Now, you don't have to use um, postfix notations in the assembler. If you prefer, just you know, hand calculate everything and just say 0, 1, 2, and so on and so forth, that's fine. Okay? But this is a handy feature so that we don't have to keep track of all those you know, numbers in our head. Instead, we can just refer to the symbolic name, which is easier to keep track. Are we good so far? Okay. So, a few more things to go over. How many people think that you might look into using postfix notation? Okay, very good. Um, let's see. I'm, I'm thinking about whether I should use the tablet or not, because um, it's going to... The, the question is, how do we convert from infix notation to postfix notation? And to <coughs> illustrate that process, it is really helpful to use a graph to do it. Um, I still have my tablet. Oh, it's right here. Or I can do it on the whiteboard. Tablet? Yep. I'm move 
my my phone is still recording. How many people know the construct or the concept of a tree? It's as a data structure kind of thing. Okay. I haven't used my tablet over the entire break, so it's just rebooting right now. Thought about getting a Note Nine and then look at the price tag and go like, yeah. <laughs> The Note 9, even with this count, is the price of a medium and laptop computer. All right, so we'll go ahead and make a random infix notation thing. So we'll say x plus y uh, to the power of 2 plus 1, and then the entire thing times um, z plus w. Let's make it minus. Okay, and divide this by uh, n plus m. And then take the square root of the entire thing. Okay, there we go. Looks ugly. So I can do this without you know doing the conversion process. So we'll go. So I will show you how I do it you know manually. So the way I do it is to look into the innermost part of the parentheses, okay? And also from left to right. So x plus y is the first thing I need to deal with because it's inner is in the innermost part of the parentheses, so I convert that first. X plus Y is just X, Y, and then a plus, okay? So once we are, we are done with that, we also want to take the square of that, okay? So we are specifying two, and then the power of, okay? And then we want to add one to the result of the square. So it's one plus. Then we are kind of done with that whole thing, the next thing we want to do is to calculate what is z minus w. So that will be z w minus. So at this point, we'll have the left hand side and also the right hand side of the multiplication. So we just perform a multiplication here. Now we, do, now we need to figure out the um, divisor or the denominator, which is just n, m, and then the plus. So at this point, we have the numerator and also the denominator. We just have to calculate a, the division, and then we take the square root of that thing. So that's how I just kind of do it manually or mentally. Um, this used to be things that people have to do all day long. Okay, if you have you know any uncle, you know dad, or you know any parent, you know who is uh, who, who, who has been an engineer since maybe the seventies and use HP calculators. That's how HP calculators take as input. They don't use parentheses. There's no parentheses in the earlier HP calculators. Okay, so they have to use the postfix notation. So now the question is, um, but how do we convert this? You know, if this is kind of like the first time we do something like this. Well, you look at this as a tree. 
So this is the root of the tree, and the root of the tree is the last operation you have to perform. In this case, the last operation is the square root of. Okay, so we say okay, that's a square root of. Square root of only takes one parameter, so we only have one you know trial node here. That trial node is the result of the division. That's the second last operation. Division takes two things. Okay, so division takes up two things. Um, the numerator is the difficult one. The numerator has a multiplication, which also takes up two things. The one side is easy. It's just the subtraction of z and w. The other side is a little bit more com complex. It's a one. And the other side is the square of something. Okay, let me take back here. So it's the to the power of. So it's taking something to the power of two, and that thing is the sum of x and y. Okay, and then the other side is just n. Um, the division has the sum of n and m as the uh, denominator. So that's the entire tree. So once you have a tree, the way that you generate the post-fix notation is to do what we call a depth first first traversal. So you go all the way to the deepest part on the left on the left hand side. When you cannot go any further, you say, oh, it's x. Then you go back up and you ask, can we explore some more of this subtree? Yes. Y has not been explored, so explore Y. But Y has no, um, there's nothing under Y, so you spill out here Y here. Then you go back to the plus. But by this time, you go back to the plus, there's nothing else to explore but the plus, so you spit out the plus. Then you go back up to the, to, to the power of, and you ask, do we have anything with this to the power of that we have not explored? Yep, we have this two that we have not explored. Explore the two, speed out the two, go back to the power of. This time there's nothing else to explore with to the power of. So you speed out the, to the power of um, onto the, the sequence. Then you go back up to the plus. Um, well, we got one more thing on the plus that we have not explored. So speed that out, go back to the plus. This time there's nothing else to explore. You speed out the plus, then you go back up to the multiplication. But we have the, the entire right-hand side unexplored. So you go to the right-hand side, you go to the minus. Well, there's nothing that we have explored yet but the minus. So you go to the left-hand side first, which is the z. Still have the z. You go back up to the minus. Well, we still have the right-hand side unexplored. You go to the right-hand side, we explore the w. We, ex we spit out the w. You go back to the minus. Now we have explored everything with that tree. We spit out the minus. You go back to the multiplication. This time we got both sides of the multiplication explored. We spill out the multiplication. We get back up to the division. But the division has the entire right-hand side unexplored. So we go to the right-hand side. We go to the plus. Then we go to the left-hand side of this, which is n. Spill out the n. Go back up to the plus. We have the right-hand side for the n to explore. Spill out the n. Go back up to the plus. This time we have nothing to explore with the plus. Spill out the plus. Go back up to the division. This time we have nothing else to explore with the division. Spit out the division. And then we go back up to the square root of. And this time we have nothing else to explore with the square root of. And we spit out the square root of. So there, there is a formal procedure to actually spit out the sequence. Um, but why do you think I chose post-fix notation as an expression? Because it's easy. Okay, it's very easy to parse because you know this entire thing, everything is just you know separated by a space. So there are um, there's a split function in the spreadsheet that can take a string with a cer with certain characters as the delimiters and it will just spit out the components. So I can easily spit out you know the, the entire array as x, y, plus, 2 to the power of, and so on. So now it's just in sequentially going through this. Um, to evaluate this, I need a stack, okay? Not the same kind of stack that we use in this class, but the same kind of concept. So we push x on the stack, we push y on the stack, 
What the plus is going to do is to pop two items from the stack, perform the addition, and then push the sum back on the stack. Okay? And then two is push on the stack, so now we have two items on the stack. To the power of, once again, it's going to pop two items from the stack. It's going to calculate the first item popped. Okay, the second item popped from the stack to the power of the first item from the stack, and then push the result of the power back on the stack. And then we push one on the stack, and then the plus is going to take the result of the power and the one, and then perform the addition, and so on. So it's relatively easy to parse and process and evaluate when it is already in post-fix notation. In fix notation, interestingly, is actually quite difficult to parse. Especially when you, when you have to deal with parentheses, then you have to kind of count the number of levels of parentheses and so on and so forth. And with infix notation, you also need what we call a look ahead symbol because you have to predetermine addition has a lower priority than multiplication. So that is actually you know, kind of difficult to deal with. This doesn't have to deal with any of those. There's no operator priority to talk about. There, there are no parentheses either. So it's really easy to implement. And that's why I chose to use postfix notation to make expressions in the assembly. But it was a very useful addition because now we can actually use symbolic names to refer to different things and we can use you know, equations or expressions to calculate the definitions of the numbers. So who in real life would use postfix notation? That seems kind of odd. So does anyone know of any industry standards that makes use of postfix notation? By a major company, not a kind of weird one of the you know, company that tax on Would you guys consider Adobe to be a relatively large software company? So, hmm? yeah, yeah, yeah. So Adobe has several standards, okay? Uh, the one that you guys are most familiar with is PDF, Portable Document Format. But guess what? Portable document format makes use of postfix notation in underneath. Because PDF is actually a second generation uh, product of PostScript, P O S T Post S C R I T script. And PostScript is a printer, quote unquote, printer language. Uh, many expensive printers still recognize that language. And guess why it's called PostScript? Because it uses postfix notation. What, is, what do you think it uses postfix notation for? Evaluating expressions? Yes. But also to specify how to draw, where to draw circles. Okay? So you basically, it's a language for drawing things. Like, you know, I want to draw a circle at this, you know, centered at this particular coordinate. I want it to be a ellipse, you know, so it's kind of like this. This is the length of the long end. This is the length of the short end. This is how it's supposed to be tilted. So post, post script is a language that allows a computer to quote unquote paint and draw on the printer. So it's not sending the individual dots over. It is sending commands over to the printer and say, I want this circle at the center of this page and the radius is going to be one inch. Okay, so it's going to send exactly the same command to a 300 dpi printer as a 600 dpi printer and the same to a 1200 dpi printer. Because everything is just measured using a particular unit, maybe inches, maybe you know, centimeters, or maybe millimeters. I don't really know exactly which unit, but the printer itself is interpreting that and going like, okay, now how do I render a circle on a piece of paper? Well, that's up to the printer. So that makes the printer driver extremely easy to write because it, it's device independent. And PDF is kind of the same thing. So if you have a super high resolution screen, things will look really sharp and really nice. But you can also have a lower resolution screen. Things will still display. It's just not as sharp and not as smooth. So it's the same thing. But anyway, uh, postfix notation is not rare. Okay, it's just that we don't get to use it very often, but underneath a lot of actual 
you know, software, it is actually utilized often. So on your path to your computer programming career, you probably will see it more than once. All right, well, we are out of time. So we'll transition to the lab and I'll answer any questions over there regarding the, the lab itself. Turn off that recorder.